War is as old as human civilization, existing as long as humans settled down to farm crops over 10,000 years ago. And war drives countless stories, from historical fiction over contemporary fiction, science fiction and fantasy. Especially the latter is filled with war. No matter if it's a war between two or more states, or the war against the Dark Lord that threatens the peaceful lands of the good kingdom. Trademark. War has driven the myths and legends of old as much as the first fantasy stories before and beyond Tolkien. So how exactly does war work? How can you as a world builder write war into your story without the war feeling like a plot point that happens for plot reasons and for nothing else? I'll answer this question in a set of several videos. War deserves extended attention, considering wars are an interesting and complex topic. In this video I'll focus on how wars are started and why two opposing factions might be going to war in the first place and how you can incorporate this into your world building. There is this famous quote attributed to Karl von Clausewitz, a German military officer and political philosopher from the Napoleonic era, written in his book On War, called On War. Der Krieg ist eine bloße Fortsetzung der Politik mit anderen Mitteln. War is the continuation of policy with other means. Uh, this statement in isolation might be enough to keep in mind for your world building, but it has been taken out of context since its conception, especially by the Prussian military. Uh, this statement was part of a dialectical argument clause of it constructed. At the same time, he described that war is nothing but a show of force, a duel or wrestling match between two major factions. Lastly, he concluded that war is neither one or the other. The synthesis lies within the fascinating trinity of the unstable interactions between violent emotion, pure chance, and the rational calculations of the state that is the continuation of policy. Uh, but I don't want to bore you with the endless rehearsal of the philosophy on war. So instead I'll get into the meat of things. What are these policies that might people consider going to war? What are the reasons that make people or rather governments act on their emotions? And what influences of pure chance might help a war to boil over? 1914. Europe sees itself entangled into a confusing web of alliances, promises, treaties, boiling conflicts and a terrible arms race between the two major nations on the continent. The reasons for the start of the First World War are as controversial as they can get and are still debated. You don't necessarily have to get into the same depth of detail as the First World War. But the illusion of detail is enough, like always. Let's look at the three parts of the trinity Clausewitz described and how they applied to the First World War. Violent emotion, the duel or wrestling match Clausewitz described of two rivaling nations. The Prussian state and later the German Empire militarized its society more and more over the years. Nationalistic and pro-military propaganda was taught from school to adulthood, but they weren't the only ones. Britain had a similar problem, starting at around the same time once the balance of power came into question with the rise central power of Germany, especially with the end of Bismarck's political reign in Germany and later the death of Queen Victoria, a terrible naval arms race between the two nations commenced, while the masses got more and more nationalistic. The war enthusiasm and jingoism in both societies at the start of World War I is represented perfectly with the mobilization efforts of Germany and Britain. The drive of people from all classes that joined the war was immense, so much so that even leftist politicians betrayed their anti-war stances and voted in favor of the war. Not that the SPD is known for their steadfast political stances without any signs of hypocrisy. The emotion 
original reaction isn't exclusive to the people, however. Emperor Wilhelm II is known for having major inferiority complexes because of his mother and his crippled arm. This majorly influenced German politics and basically nullified all chances of a de-escalation of the conflict, considering he would have rather gone to war than break the German pride. And if you are looking for one emotion to fill this part of the trinity, pride is your safest bet, no matter if nationalistic pride or the faint pride as a statesman. Chance, the second part of the trinity. Of course, there are many factors of chance that inevitably led to the start of the first world war, but there's no factor as impactful as the murder of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. The murder of Franz Ferdinand and his wife was committed by a Bosnian nationalist that was part of a group fighting for the freedom of Bosnia that was recently annexed by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The big thing is that the murder lost the track of the Archduke's car and only found the car again after the driver took a wrong turn. Thus, he was finally able to commit the act of murder. This murder was only the powder keg that brought Europe to flame. It would have happened sooner or later anyways considering Austria's eye on Serbia. But in the end, it was this moment of chance th that led to the defining event of the 20th century, which was the First World War. And I don't want to get started on the many moments of chance that happened throughout the war, especially since this video's topic is about the war's start. The continuation of policy. This might perhaps be the most obvious example. The situation in the Balkans was a diplomatic powder keg waiting to be lit, including the crumbling old man on the Bosporus that was the late Ottoman Empire. The ambitions of the newly created independent Balkan states like Serbia and Bulgaria, as well as the two empires of Russia and Austria-Hungary. Russia supported the independence of all Slavic states in the Balkans, while Austria-Hungary saw it as a core part of the Hungarian part of its empire. The situation in the Balkans led to the July Crisis, a set of diplomatic maneuvers and incidents from all future war parties that followed the Archduke's assassination. Diplomats, politicians and generals in all of Europe were split between assuming that an upcoming coming war would be the best interest of the nation, while others remained ignorant to any chance of war at all. In the end, Serbia declined Austria-Hungary's ultimatum once they learned about Russia's secret mobilization in favor of their independence. From that point on, de-escalation was basically impossible. To summarize, Clausewitz's trinity of emotion, chance and state calculation influences each other with every situation. If the war in your setting was started over reasons that fit these three bills, you'll definitely be on the right path. Let's take a look on how I've done it in my world. The Eunuch War is a devastating civil war within the Basilean Magocracy. The war was fought between the Eunuch faction and an alliance of Stradecoi, who hold the outer provinces of the empire. The struggle between these two factions is as old as the Magocracy itself, surpassing the age of the current dynasty. This is a war about control over the 10-year-old Magocrator and thus control over the empire by the respective factions. Emotions run deep, but these emotions are exclusive to the elites. The Empire's warlords hate the eunuchs as much as the eunuchs hate the warlords, splitting the noble class into two, while the lower classes don't really care about who collects their taxes. They usually follow the party promising the most, even if their promises might never even happen. The Eunuch War began eight years ago after the former Magocrator died under strange circumstances. The Eunuchs already amassed lots of power at that point and were easily able to take control of the Emperor's two-year-old son. The Strategoi, on the other hand, accused the Eunuchs of murdering the Magocrator. There's no evidence to any murder, but they haven't been disproven yet either. Suspiciously, the late Magocrator 
Predator's body shown during the funeral was proven fake. And for reasons the eunuch never announced, the late Magocrator's daughter that had no right to the throne since she wasn't born under the astral star, was sent away from the court and the capital of Basilea. A very unpopular move within the noble class, considering she was a fierce opponent of the eunuch rule. This set of events let the warlord faction refuse any real diplomatic notion to ease the tension within the empire. They declared the eunuch faction as traitors to the Magocrator and that they see their duty in rescuing the emperor from the dark influences of the eunuch. The eunuchs of course retaliated with a similar response, branding the warlords as traitors and that their eradication will be richly rewarded. Luckily for the eunuchs, the emperor was in their hands, making their own decree much more meaningful, since it had the emperor's stamp on it. This is the end of the video, I hope you liked it. If so, leave a like and subscribe and tell me in the comments about your own wars in your setting. See ya!